Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is 12 o'clock on a Sunday, which means it's time for a Q&A. Now, this is where I take all of the questions that you've asked over the course of the week, and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. So, first of all, thank you very much for asking all of the questions that you have this week. This whole thing lives and dies by you guys asking questions, and uh, I've had a quick skim through, and they look really good this week. And remember, when I do a Q&A, I don't look at them beforehand because... I tend to find that you get more raw, honest answers if I kind of just read them and, and answer them off the cuff. Uh, if you have any questions that you want answering, the idea is very simple. Leave them in the comments to this video, and then I will, I will I'll answer them the following week. Now, please remember that I filmed the Q&A on a Wednesday. It's currently Wednesday morning over here. Uh, so I filmed the Q&A on a Wednesday or a Thursday. So if you want to absolutely be sure of having your question answered, then make sure you get it in by kind of Tuesday at the latest. Anyway, without further ado, there's a ton of questions this week, so let's go straight into this week's questions. Okay, so the first question today is by Naptown Illusions, and Naptown says, Craig, what do you think about sleeving? Jeffrey Wang has a lecture coming out on the 30th, and the sleeving magicians can't wait. I love sleeving, and I love watching it, and for many, many years, I used to do sleeving a lot. My favourite routine, and, and personally, I think, still the best routine when it comes to sleeving anything is Silver Dream by Justin Miller. I, I All these years later, I still think J Silver Dream is still the best um, sort of trick that you can do with sleeving because it doesn't look like sleeving is actually a thing. It really just looks like those coins disappear. If you don't know what Silver Dream is, three regular coins and one at a time, the coins just disappear. The second coin especially, you're moving the coins from one hand to the other. You hear them moving from one hand to the other and then just one disappears in midair. It's a beautiful vanish of three coins. And it's a perfect example of Justin's creativity and genius when it comes to routining. And I still don't think all these years later, anybody's kind of touched Silver Dream. I think that um, there's other routines that have come out for sure. And some of them are very clever, but a lot of them are convoluted. And I think that there's this certain clarity when it comes to Silver Dream that makes it unbeatable, at least in my opinion. Having said that, I, I don't do Silver Dream anymore. Ryland does. I don't do Silver Dream anymore because I never perform unless my sleeves are rolled up. And that's just a personal preference, and that's for a couple of reasons. The first reason is I have all these tattoos, and a lot of them are designed to do magic tricks. And I like to have them on display the whole time. That's kind of part of my brand. And if I've got my sleeves rolled down, I, they can't see them. And the other thing is, a lot of the time, when I'm performing and, you know, I'm there with my sleeves rolled up or I'm there in a short sleeve shirt, a lot, a lot of people say to me when I've performed the trick, and his sleeves are rolled up. And it kind of makes me think, you know, how many people go to the whole sleeving thing when they're trying to come up with a method? Even if that's not the method, it's still probably the first thing that people think of. So, you know, it's for that reason that I don't use sleeving. But if I was going to sleeve, and as I say, Ryland does Silver Dream. I think he's put it on his channel or he's putting it on his channel. Um, and he does it brilliantly. But if, if, if you're looking for a routine, in my opinion, when it comes to sleeving, Silver Dream is still unbeatable. Okay, so the next question is by the Drunk Magic ukulele, ukulele player. Love that. Uh, and uh, he says, Hope you're well, Craig. Do you still perform Quarantine? And also, what's your favourite Rocky film? Mine is either two or six. Yes. Well, okay, so first of all, Rocky 2. There you go. Job done. Can't be beaten. Uh, in terms of Quarantine, yes, I still perform it. Not as much as I used to, but I still... In fact, I did it at a gig last weekend. I don't know if it's available anymore. Um, I was really proud of that back in the day. It was one of the first tricks I ever released. If you don't know what quarantine is, it was my take on the Omni deck. And the whole idea is you got a shrink wrapped deck. So you got a deck of cards that were shrink wrapped and you got an empty card box that was shrink wrapped. And the context of the routine is you have somebody shuffle a deck, you have them freely take a card, they sign the card, somebody else is hold, holding onto the card box, they sign the card, um, then you have it lost in the deck, uh, and then when it's lost in the deck, you then take some, uh, you take the, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Some shrink wrap, you know, some cellophane. You take some cellophane because when you open up the card box, you can take the cellophane off or you can just have some loose cellophane in your pocket. You take the cellophane and what you do is you take the cellophane and you take the card box and you do this and you apparently just 
push. It's a little bit like Airtight by Jay Sankey. You push the deck of cards inside the cellophane and immediately you hand it off for them to examine and they can see that this entire deck is shrink-wrapped, right? And then you say, of course, your card's in there somewhere and then you take the deck and you just visibly pull their card through the shrink-wrap and it's their signed card. You then give them their signed card. They can examine the deck. It's still shrink-wrapped. You can examine the card box because the card box is now all uh, is now shrink-wrapped because that's the kicker ending. You say, because I understand how I shrink-wrapped the deck. I understand how the card came out the shrink-wrap. What I don't understand is how the deck became, is how the box became shrink-wrapped. And you look over at the box and now the box is shrink-wrapped. It's an incredible routine. I used to use it to close my lecture and I, I, I still do it to this day. Um, it's not available anymore. I, I have had some people say, will you re-release it? And uh, I suppose I could. I mean, I love it. It's, it's one of the things I'm most proud of as a product. Um, I know. Let me, let me know. What do you guys think? Would you like to see that as a re-release? Do you do it? Uh, what do you think of it? You know, I, I, I still think it's a very organic way of doing the, um, the, the, the Omnideck. So rather than making an impossible object, as I said, the best way to describe it, it's got very much got that airtight style feel to it. The visual where you put the deck inside the, um, the shrink wrap is just killer. So let me know what you think. But yeah, in answer to your question, yes, I still do quarantine. It's great. Okay, so the next question is from Darren Chachui or Chetua. Sorry, I think I've pronounced your name wrong. Hey, Craig, great show as usual. Any recommendations for resources on credit card magic? Borrowing money seems to become harder as time goes by. Yeah, for sure. I know what you're talking about. Um, we are becoming a cashless society, and uh, I'm seeing this happen more and more. Uh, you know what? Ideas with credit cards, there's a whole bunch of them, but it depends on whether you're talking about borrowing a credit card or having a credit card that you have with you in order to be able to do a trick. So, for example, Illusionist bought out a credit card, which was really, really cool back in the day, that had a ton of reveals on it. I think it was part of their How to Read Minds Kickstarter, and then they released it as a separate product. That's a great trick because it's got a ton of ideas on there and it's got a ton of revelations so you can literally have a credit card take it out and you can do a whole bunch of stuff with it you've got credit i think it's called credica um which is um a, a routine where the 16 digit number changes into the name of the uh, playing card which is again a really cool idea but that involves you having your own credit card there um which is cool which is absolutely fine however uh borrowing a person's credit card is great because uh, it means that uh, it, it, you're upping at a level. When you, whenever you can borrow something, whether it be a ring or money or anything, uh, it, it makes the routine more interesting, at least in my opinion. So, yeah, I mean, let me think of some resources. So, first of all, Nate Cranzo has an incredible vanish of a credit card that I've used for years. It's on the Visual Voodoo DVD, or it might be on the Out the Box DVD, which are both available from Penguin. And it looks like you take a credit card, and just make it disappear in your hands, and both hands are empty, it's a great vanish. And then you can reproduce it anywhere. And to be honest, a lot of the time, when I'm doing borrowed credit card magic, um, I'll just have a card to wallet, and I'll have the credit card vanish, and I'll have it reappear inside the credit card. Oh, sorry, I'll have it reappear inside an envelope, inside my wallet. I mean, that's just a really simple, easy thing to do that you can do anytime, anywhere. And you can use any type of vanish that you want to. So you could do like a Tenkai vanish or a, a longitudinal type of vanish or one of those kind of old school snap style vanishes or the Nate Cranzo thing. The whole idea is that you take a card, you vanish it, you take a credit card, you vanish it, and then you reach into your pocket, you load it into the envelope. And that can be a really nice, simple thing to do. You know, like, like I kind of borrow your credit card, boom, it's inside my uh, envelope, which is inside my wallet. I mean, that's that's cool. Um, another thing that you can do, uh, you want to look into some of the stuff by Mark Leverage, especially in the Forever Flapping books, because he had some really nice stuff with envelopes and credit cards back in the day. And they are available on his uh, website as an ebook, so you can just download them immediately. He had this one thing in particular, which is really good, which was a switch of a credit card for... Uh, inside an envelope. So the whole idea is you bring out a stack of credit, uh, a stack of envelopes. You borrow a credit card. You put it into an envelope, or you have them put it into an envelope. They sign the flap. They sign the other side, 
and then they hold on to it. But you've switched that in the action of doing it. You've switched that for another envelope, but with almost no sleight of hand. So uh, what I've done with that in the past, and this is a really cool idea, is get a duplicate credit card of your own. Now, the easiest way to get a duplicate credit card is to have your own credit card or have your own debit card and say to the bank, I've lost one. Can you send me another one? They'll send you another one and then you've got duplicates. You have to wait a couple of days for the card to come through. But that's the easiest way to do it. Right. And then what you do is you put a duplicate credit card into the envelope you're switching in. I'm not going to go through the technique. It's Mark's technique. But you have the credit card into the envelope that you're switching in. So now what you do is you say, hey, I've got a whole bunch of envelopes here. Can you take this one? Can you put your credit card into it? Thank you very much. Can you sign that side? Can you sign that side? Amazing. I really appreciate it. Hold that in between your hands. So there's no way I can get your credit card now, right? Uh, we're going to do something with my credit card. OK, so this is my credit card. Um, this is this is mine. That one's yours. I'm going to put my credit card inside an envelope. And, and you're going to do exactly the same thing. So you're going to put my credit card inside an envelope. Can you sign that one for me on the front of the back? Brilliant. So you've got my credit card. You've got your credit card in the side envelopes. And now with no moves, you're done. Using Mark's technique, you can now do a transposition of two credit cards very, very easily. So when they open up their credit card, uh, they open up their envelope, your credit card's in there. And when they open up the other envelope, their credit card's in there, if that makes sense. So it's a really nice transposition that can play actually really big. Um, the only other thing that I could tell you, and I think I mentioned this once on a 5x5, five five, but this is a really great idea that I've been doing for years. And this is something, when I came up with this, I was so happy. If you have, most people these days, right, have Apple Pay. And if you don't know what Apple Pay is, it's a way of paying for something on your phone or your watch. Now, how do you activate Apple Pay? You can activate Apple Pay without actually using your face ID. How you activate it on most of the modern phones, on the old phones where there was a, a thumbprint thing, you double tap on that thumbprint thing and it would bring up Apple Pay. These days, when you're using facial recognition, you, you double tap the, the button on the right-hand side twice and it brings up Apple Pay. And the whole idea is then you look at the phone um, and, uh, and, and it activates Apple Pay and then you use it to pay for something, right? And what you do with Apple Pay is you have it set up with a particular credit card. So you have Apple Pay set up with a credit or a debit card, normally your main debit or credit card with your bank account. So my Apple Pay is set up with the main debit or credit card that I have with my, uh, with my bank, right? Now, what you're going to do here is you're going to borrow their phone during the context of another routine. So a lot of the time I'll do this with digital force back. I'll say, can I borrow your phone? I'm going to search for an image and that's going to be a prediction. And uh, what I'll do is I'll take the phone off them. And this is the concept. With Apple Pay, if you, if you activate Apple Pay without actually using the facial recognition, if you activate Apple Pay, it'll bring up an image of the credit card that they've got stored on Apple Pay. And it will bring up what the bank is and it will show you the last four digits of their debit card uh, that's registered on Apple Pay. It just shows you the last four digits of the 16 digit number. So I borrow their phone and I just look at their phone and I go, oh, and as I look at it, I double tap and I clock what the bank is and I clock what the last four digits of the, uh, of the credit card is. And I just remember that. I then hand that phone to uh, the person back again and I go and as I do I press the button which deactivates the Apple Pay and I say can you do me a favor can you just unlock it for me I'll then search for an image as a prediction I'll give the phone back to them to hold on to so they've now got that I'll do digital force bag and I'll show that the image matches brilliant then I can go into something else and then I can say well let's try something else have you got a debit card on you or credit card and they go, yes. And I go, OK, well, where is it? And they say, and I go, OK, brilliant. Concentrate on which bank you bank with. It's Lloyd's. Now, just there is incredible because you've never seen their bank account. There's time misdirection between when they, you borrowed their phone and when you're doing this. And even if there wasn't time misdirection, they're never going to associate the two actions anyway. You're now in a situation where you've told them the bank they bank with and you've never met them before. And then you go, do you know the last four digits of your card? And and if they say yes, you go brilliant. If they say no, which is even better, you go, you do know them. You just don't know you know them. Have you got the credit card on you? And they go, yes. And you go, OK, concentrate. And you tell them the four digits and they look at the credit card and it matches. And you've told them the last four digits of their credit card. I remember doing this once and they didn't have the credit card on them and they rang up their wife. And uh, they got the wife to read the last four digits of their credit card number out that I just told them. And they freaked out like we're talking 
David Blaine Dynamo style reactions here. So <coughs> that's a really cool thing that you can do that I've done for years and feel free to use that. It's something that uh, I use an awful lot in my close-up work. And the nice thing is they don't know what you're doing. So if you take their phone back and they haven't got Apple Pay set up, you just don't do it. You know, you still do the routine that you're borrowing the phone for, but you just don't do the Apple Pay thing. But 99 times out of 100, you'll be able to do this. And you've got an incredible prediction or a credible uh, mind-reading feat where you're telling them the bank that they've banked with and the last four digits of their credit card number, and you haven't even apparently done anything. So, yeah, there's a few sources. Uh, I could do a hows and whys of credit cards if you would like me to and kind of go into more detail on this stuff, but I think I've talked about it enough for now. Um, let me know if you want to see a video on credit card magic. Okay, so the next question is by Adrian Suter, and Adrian says, Hi, Craig, three points. Number one, thanks for an interesting answer to my question. You're welcome. Number two, Netflix will be more useful with a download option. Um, we'll get to that later on. A lot of people have commented. And number three, a question for next week. What are some of the great two-person acts? Wow. What are some of the great two-person acts? Well, obviously, you've got to go with Siegfried and Roy, and you've got to go with Penn and Teller. I mean, when you think about it, they're two of the greatest two-person acts in history, you know, Penn, Penn and Teller and, uh, are dominating Vegas and have done for years, and before that it was obviously Siegfried and Roy. I think anybody who made a list of the best two-person acts in history would have those two 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 guys up at the, uh, the top of the list. Outside of that, let me think, a very underrated two-person act, and I think that the reason they're underrated is because they don't perform together all the time they've got their own career as individual entertainers but they have got a brilliant two-person act is scott alexander and puck if you've ever seen scott alexander and puck perform together i think it's hilarious they do the t-cut the best version of the t-cut i've ever seen which is like a, a vertical soaring in half and the whole idea is that you saw through somebody and then you turn their torso on the side it looks great um the uh the, the way that scott and puck do it absolutely brilliant because what they do is uh i think it's puck i might be wrong but i think it's puck swallows a balloon does a balloon swallow and then uh and then and then goes into this thing uh scott alexander cuts him in half turns him on the side and then pulls the balloon out of his torso and then puts him back together again which i just think is absolutely brilliant so um yeah i'd say for for sure you've got you've got to put um you've got to put puck and alexander in there uh, who else? Young and Strange over here in the UK, I think, are the best two-person double act going at the moment. I'm a huge fan of Richard Young and Sam Strange. I think they are incredible. Their performances on Penn and Teller Foolers, their performances on Championships of Magic. Rich, Richard Young is also one of the nicest guys I've ever interviewed. He is so awesome. And I think that uh, I don't think there's anyone better as a double act over here in the UK at any rate. And I think there's very few people that are as good as young and strange period all over the world i don't think there's hardly anyone who beats them but uh yeah young and young and strange i think have to be right there at the top of the list the way that they perform their illusions the way that they perform their unique brand of comedy i think it's just incredible i really do um who else have we got morgan and west i think you have to give it up to morgan and west they're so different they're so vibrant they're so unique uh and they turn their, their their talents to so many different things it's not just magic it's science it's everything so i think uh i think morgan and west are really really good um you know what i i i've mentioned them once before on the channel but i have to say that one of my favorite double acts of yesteryear that unfortunately aren't around anymore are the Wizards of Odd, uh, who were on the circuit probably about seven or eight years ago now, John T. Sparrow and Aaron Hayes. And for my money, they could have been the best double act in the history of magic if they kept going. Unfortunately, I think John T. has emigrated to Canada and doesn't really do magic anymore. And Aaron, although still in magic, I think is in radio now as well. And it's such a shame that they aren't together anymore because the Wizards of Odd were absolutely brilliant. And uh, they had this wonderful routine where they both held a box, uh, like a cardboard box, and, and, and they were putting something in one box and it was flying out the other box from different sides of the stage. It was great. And you could adapt their act to family audiences or 
corporate audiences or rowdy audiences. They were always went over really well at places like Illusions Magic Bar, Smoke and Mirrors. Um, so yeah, I, I would I would absolutely say the Wizards of Odd in there. Unfortunately, they're not around anymore. Um, one of my favourite double acts over here in the UK is Carl and Dave. I think that the umbrella. I remember first seeing them perform at the IBM convention, and that's when they won the Comedy Award. Um, and they are hilarious. Uh, Carl's character bounces off Dave's character so well. And it, it, watching them perform is a masterclass in, in, in that type of magic, in that type of comedy magic. And um, I don't think they do it anymore, but the, uh, their version of the um, Assistance Revenge is just great because they've made it look like a shower curtain. And and you've got Carl in there trying to escape, and then he's upside down, and then he's like he, he's got a shower cap on. It's just hilarious, and their uh, and their umbrellas of doom, I think it is, which was the finale for their show for many years. Their umbrellas of doom are brilliant. The way that they do the uh, three bucket Monty is just amazing. They're just great. I, I, I've got to give it up for uh, for those guys. They're really really good. Carl and Dave, my pink bin. Hashtag my pink bin. Um, is there anybody else? There's probably tons of acts out there that are really, really good. Um, and I, I could go through all of them, but off the top of my head, literally just thinking it through off the top of my head, those are the acts that I think of when I think of the best two person acts in history. Okay, so the next question is by Jason Lewis. And Jason says, your Q&As are great. Take me ages to go through as I'm always searching for things you mentioned. Thank you very much. Uh, right, uh, question because I'm nosy. Why do you use different magic producers instead of one? Uh, very good question. Yeah, very good question. Why do I do, why do I do that? Is there anything else to your question? Uh, no. Then we're talking about metrics. Okay. Uh, just because there's a couple of different reasons. So the first reason is um, I, I I kind of went with the whole one magic producer thing for years. Back in the day, before I left the magic community, and then ultimately came back, everything got put out through World Magic Shop and. While that was fine, I, I like the idea. Different companies are really fun to work with in different ways. And they are so different. Uh, an experience working with Alakazam is totally different to Murphy's, which is totally different to Penguin, which is totally different to you know, Prop Dog, for example, or it's totally different to the 1914. Every single production company, is, it, it, I have a different experience with them, and it's all a wonderful experience. If it wasn't a wonderful experience, I wouldn't be working with them. So if you see me releasing more than one product through a company, it's because I've really enjoyed working with them. Um, and th that's the main thing. I just don't want to be beholden to one company. I like spreading myself around a little bit. And and the other thing is, um, which is also as important, really, in my opinion, is different production companies. I think that different tricks are suitable for different production companies. So Visible, the only choice, really, was the 1914. Because of how they produce stuff, I thought they're going to get this 100%, and they did. So, you know, when I bought out Visible, it was like, this has to be bought out through the 1914. The thing that I've got coming out through Blackpool, at uh, Blackpool with Murphys, because of how the trick needed to be made, realistically, the only option was to put it out through Murphys because they had the resources in place to be able to do what I needed them to do. It wasn't an easy thing to put together. Um, yeah, and, and it's the same with every company. At every company I'm getting different experiences with, but I just look at a trick and I think, well, that gossip, for example, felt like an Alakazam trick. It felt like an Alakazam trick. And um, that, that, and it was also my first trick back since coming into the magic community. And I wanted to bring out, out through Alakazam because for years I've been wanting to work with Peter Nardi. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really just because... I, I like spreading myself around and I'm speaking to other companies that I haven't bought anything out with. Um, I'm speaking to a couple of different companies actually about a few different things um, and that, that I've been working on for years and years and years and I'd like to, and, and really I, it's because I've got a bucket list of companies that I want to work with. And um, you know, I'd, I'd like to work with these various different companies. Also, it, it gives me an insight into how these companies operate. So through working with Murphy's Magic, I've kind of understood how Murphys do things, and that's really given me an insight into their operations, if that makes sense. So, yeah, uh, really, there's no hard and fast rule. It's just because 
I find that certain tricks that I want to release and I think are releasable uh, because I only want to release stuff if it adds value to the community. I don't want to release something for the sake of releasing. I don't need to. So, you know, I, 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 different tricks just feel like they're perfect for different companies. That's the main reason. So hopefully that answers your question. You're not being nosy at all. Is there anything you want to ask on these sessions, you can. Nothing's off the table. Okay, so the next question is from Coco uh, Petrovic. And Coco says, hey, Craig, love the channel. What you're doing really inspires me. Thank you very much. I'm looking to make an order at Alakazam, but I've never ordered from them before. Do you or Ryland have any suggestions for great material I can get from there? Kind regards, or best regards. Yeah, Coco, but if you're going to go to the trouble of ordering from Alakazam, and you're not in the UK, which I don't think you are. Um, don't order the Murphy's items. Order the stuff that's exclusive to Alakazam. And you can go back and look at some of my review show specials on Alakazam and see the stuff that I recommend. But I mean, uh, I would definitely go for an extractor deck. I think that's one of the best things that Alakazam have ever brought out. The extractor deck is brilliant. Trilogy Extreme is another trick that I kind of think is perfect for people to get. I love the Wallet series. So uh, Will to Read by Steve Deller is a great thing to go for. Gossip is a great thing to go for. Obviously, I'm going to be biased. I'm going to say my own stuff. But outside of my own stuff, um, Clued Up by Jamie Dawes is brilliant. Executive Suite is brilliant. Uh, the Las Vegas trick where you get the poker chip and everything. I think that's really, really good. Uh, the RB coin deck is really good. The, their back catalogue is incredible. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but Pete's got this version of uh, um, Pocket pocket transpo where you put four kings in your pockets and they change places with four aces. That's a really great trick that's well worth uh, looking into as well. So, and, and some of David Jonathan's magic is, and D Nicholas Mavresis, God, they've got so much good stuff, haven't they? Nicholas Mavresis, the collector, is just super cool. Most of Nicholas's stuff is super cool. You look at David Jonathan, all of his material that he's put out through Alakazam is brilliant. Um, so really, just look at the trailers. Their trailers are normally very honest. Uh, Safe by Chris Congreve. My God, I keep thinking of Chris Congreve. Um, Roll by Chris Congreve is really good as well. Um, there's so much really good Chris Congreve stuff. Yeah, just just get, get go and have a look at the trailers. Have a look at the trailers, see what you think, and, and pick the ones that speak to you. But if it was me and I was going to pick a top three outside of my own products, it would be the Extractor Deck, it would be Roll by Chris Congreve, and it would be... Clued up by Jamie Dawes. There you go. Those are the three that I'd go for. Okay, so we've got a lot of people talking about the issue of should Netflix be downloadable content or not. Uh, and a lot of people are saying, make it downloadable, make it downloadable. Uh, I, it's just the issue of piracy. But I am, I think, going to make it downloadable. Uh, just because everybody wants it downloadable. I understand that it's so much easier to download something versus stream it. Um, I get that. I get that. So I am going to make the content downloadable on Netflix. We're putting new stuff up all the time. I think we're aiming for five new tricks every fortnight. So we're going to be uploading 10 new tricks every month on top of everything else that gets put up on a regular ongoing basis. So, yeah, I think that um, I think we're going to go for it. I think we're going to make it downloadable. So thank you for everybody that put your two pence worth in. It was very much appreciated and uh, it's helped me make the decision. So thank you. Okay, so the next question is from James Prentice. Prentice, Prent, Prentice, I think it is. Really like your channel, especially the review shows. Thank you, James. I love the way you do the show with your son. It's really cool to see his view and perspective of the tricks as well. I'm glad that you like it. Thank you. What is the best way, in your opinion, to approach a restaurant to perform? Sean McNulty Magician also asked this same question, I believe, about uh, approaching a restaurant. Um, I'm going to do a video on this. I did a course on this for Penguin. Uh, which was really well received. And I'm actually just in the process of putting some extra content together for the students that were in that class, which should be done hopefully by this weekend. It's taken me quite a while to put it all together. Um, but I am going to be doing a video for the channel as well. And it's not going to go into as much depth, but it's going to give you an overview on approaching restaurants. Uh, there's also going to be something on Netflix about it. And I'm talking with a couple of different production companies about putting together a huge, huge, huge project on everything that I know about restaurant magic, and that's getting the restaurant, sealing the deal, uh, the tricks that you would perform in the restaurant, specific tricks specifically for the restaurant's environment, tips, absolutely everything, no stone left unturned. Um, 
that's something that I want to produce at some point in the next year because I think that would be very valuable for people. Um, but in the meantime, if you want some advice on how to approach a restaurant, just do it. Figure out what the restaurants are that you want to approach. Figure out which ones you want to approach and then just approach them. It's a numbers game at the end of the day. The more restaurants you go and speak to, the more likely chance that you're going to have of somebody saying yes. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's basically it. It's a numbers game. And if I want to give you one big tip, I'm going to give you one big tip right now. If you are wanting to get restaurants where there are a lot of corporate people, which are the most desirable restaurants, because at the end of the day, one of the reasons to get a restaurant is to ultimately generate more work from that restaurant through the clientele that are in that restaurant. And in order to do that, you want to get people, you want to get restaurants where there's kind of movers and shakers in there that have the money to book you for corporate events or things like that. One big tip that I'll give you in the area in which you live. So I live near Birmingham. So this would be in Birmingham for me. Contact all of the hotels in the Birmingham area that are likely to have, that are likely to host people that are coming in for a conference. What I mean by that is you wouldn't want to contact the travel lodges. They're more families and budget travellers. Look for the hotels in your city that are likely to be frequented by corporate people. So, you know, wherever that may be, there's going to be tons of them in your area. And then what you want to do is you want to ring up that hotel and you want to just say to the person who answers the phone, hey, I've got a booking with you in a couple of months. I'm going to be coming over and staying for a couple of days for a corporate conference. I want to take some clients out for dinner. Can you recommend a good restaurant nearby that I can take those clients out to dinner, please? And then contact every single hotel and get them all to tell you where they would recommend you um, taking your clients out for dinner away from the hotel. Those are going to be the restaurants that those hotels are recommending to their customers and their clients and the people that are staying there. Those are the restaurants you want to get because those are the restaurants where your corporate people are going to be in. They're the people that are going to be having events where they can book somebody like you. So the big piece of advice I can give you is go and do that. Go and figure out in your area where the movers and shakers eat and then approach those restaurants. Um, there's a lot more on this subject and I will talk about it over the coming weeks and months. But just that piece of information and the knowledge of it's a numbers game and the more restaurants you approach, the more likely you are to actually end up getting a residency at one of them should start. That should give you everything that you need to go out and do it. Okay, so the next question is Mike Tyson by TKO. Hey, Craig, hope you're well. Thank you for doing this. It's very much appreciated. You're more than welcome. Here's the question. All the mentalists and all the magicians enter a UFC tournament. Who is the last man standing? Who's the person that's the most badass in real life? Wow. I'm trying to think now. It's magicians. They're all giant geeks. Uh, not all of them, admittedly, but uh, a lot of them. You know what? I, I'm going to give it down to one of two. I'm going to give it down to one or two. Either Hayashi, because doesn't Hayashi like run a martial arts dojo? And that dude is always carrying a sword around with him. Like, I think Hayashi would be a pretty badass guy in a tournament, to be perfectly honest. So I'm going to say either Hayashi or Dave Bonsall from Prop Dog, who used to be a Marine, didn't he? I mean, this is, this is a guy who got... I found it hilarious when I was on the Prop Dog Live the other day and they started off by pretending they were me and they had fake tattoo sleeves and then I walk in and, and, and uh, I was like, hey boys, how's it going? And Dave Bonsall's acting like, oh, hi Craig, hi Craig, as if he's like a little bit worried that I've turned up when in reality he could snap me like a twig without even thinking about it. So, you know, this is a guy that's, um, that's pretty badass. So I'd say probably either Dave Bonsall or Hayashi. I don't know. You guys let me know. <laughs> if there was a UFC competition and every magician in the world entered, who would be the person that won? Okay, so the next question is from Matty Mediocrity. Hey, Matty, question. Do you have any tips for crediting releases? I make all my own magic. Five or six of my effects are commercial, and I'm going to share them with the community. When you submit them to a magic company, the company has a knowledge and research team that dives deep. What about things that you self-release? It seems like an impossible standard that you're expected to go and find methods that are deliberately hidden from you just so you can mention it. It's a little bit similar to the thing you're releasing. How do you do it? It is a minefield. It, it is a minefield 
and crediting is something that I have been ridiculously over the top with for obvious reasons that I don't need to get into. And a lot of the time I've gone to people like Michael Close and I've just reached out to people like Michael Close and I've said, hey, Michael, um, could you help me with this? A lot of those really knowledgeable people will help you if you approach them with sincerity and honesty. Um, but go to people like that and just say, so if you've got a coin trick, for example, and you've got a coin trick that you want to release, you'd go to people like um, Kiona Harbottle, um, uh, Michael Rubenstein, Curtis Cam, uh, people like that. They're the guys that are going to be able to tell you whether there's something like that around or not. And a lot of the time with crediting, it's not just about crediting. It's about making sure that you haven't got something that's too similar to something else. So I have a trick that was meant to be coming out that I've pulled. And I've done it for years, years and years and years I've done this trick. And uh, I'm really well read and I showed it around to lots of different people and everyone's like, oh, that's amazing. Never seen anything like that before. And um, unfortunately, I've discovered it is very, very similar to a concept by somebody else. And I've just never seen that product. It's impossible to read everything. It's impossible to know everything. Uh, but what you don't want to do is be releasing something that's almost identical to somebody else's trick, because that's when the problems occur. The easiest way to deal with this is instead uh, by making sure that it's not similar beforehand. And if that means that you have to hold off on a while before you release it, then that's what you need to do. You know, you need to go out there and show it to as many people as possible. And the nice thing is in this day and age with modern technology and Zoom and places like that, you can show this to lots and lots of people and and somebody will know. Somebody will know. So I've I've uh, got a trick coming out at some point with the 1914, um, which uh, I, I've researched so strongly. And I showed it Lloyd and Lloyd said it was similar to something like this. And I contacted that person and he said, no, it's nothing like mine, but it might be somebody, uh, it might be something like this. I contacted that person. No, that's completely different. And, and you just got to keep checking. You just got to keep checking. And sometimes it means that you're going to have to pull the product and it's a pain in the ass. But if you want to be a creator, you have to do the right thing because you only get one chance to make a first impression. And, uh, and if you screw up, trust me, from experience, it doesn't matter if you're sincere or not sincere. If you screw up, it's going to be a very long, hard road back to people trusting you again. So the easiest way is to make sure that it's correct in the first place. And the way to do that is to reach out to as many knowledgeable people as possible, show them the idea and just say, hey, this is what I want to do. What do you think? OK, so the next question is by J. Kelly 7. And J. Kelly 7 says, I have one question this week. Simple one. What's your favorite color change? Well, I mean, I, I like loads of color changes. There's lots that I love. Um, lots and lots of color changes. I think my favorite one at the moment is, uh, I can't remember. Tell me in the comments down below. I, it's, I can't remember. I, I, I have it written down. I have it written down, but for some reason, the name of this thing always escapes me, but it's that one where you take a card and you, uh, you leave it out drugged from the deck and you shake. And as you shake, it changes from a two to a seven. And I like the idea of then taking that and cutting it and saying, well, you know, it's only an illusion if I rub it on my sleeve, it's a two. Of course, if you want the seven, you can just take it and you can flick it and it turns into the seven. And that's nice because the three color changes just kind of work with one another. Um, and it's great with a selected card. So, you know, you can have uh, a card selected. So say, for example, it's the three of, um, uh, let's say, for example, it's the three of spades, this one here. You can have the card put back. So uh, have it put back in the deck. There's the card. Remember it. Don't forget it. Look, there it is. Let's just uh, leave it in there. Look, there it is. Lost in the middle of the deck. Um, actually, I've controlled that second from top because you can control it to the top, shouldn't you? Sorry. Uh, and then uh, taking a different card. And as I say, it's just a beautiful change. It's just a really beautiful change. I love that moment where you just see it sticking out and then boom, it changes and you just see it change. I just really like that. It's one of my favorite changes to do at the moment. And it's got a lot of applications. And as I say, you can then have that three, go back into the, uh, go back into the ace and then because of how you're all set up, you then take it and you can have it go back into a three again. So that's probably my favorite color change. Um, I used to, you know, the uh, I'd love to know what people think. 
what's your favourite version of the, uh, you know, the, the sort of the twirl change? Because I see a lot of people doing a twirl change like that. And then you've obviously got people that do the original Mark D'Souza shapeshifter change. And then there's still the, uh, the old fashioned sort of snap change up here. Uh, and then uh, there's the illogical, logical double lift, which is quite, quite nice. And then there's other versions when you throw it back onto the deck and stuff like that. Recently, I used to do a twirl change a lot, but recently I've been uh, doing the uh, the shapeshifter change instead. And the shapeshifter gets a really great reaction. I used to do the shapeshifter all the time. Then I stopped for a while, started doing it again. And uh, the reaction it gets is just killer, it really is killer. Um, so yeah, I'd probably say the shape, at the moment, and things change on literally a minute by minute basis, but at the moment I'd say probably the shape shifter change or the um, or, or that one way it's out jocked. Joshua J showed me a really nice change as well. So he controls the card, I've got the double backer in here, it's a night flight deck. So he um, he controls the uh, the card. This it, have you seen this? This is quite nice. Where uh, you take a piece of uh, you take a piece of hair. I can't remember it now. I remember it. And you take a hair and you do this, and and the card comes up, and you, you it's kind of like an impromptu rising card. And he goes that your card, and they go no, and then you come over, and I've just butchered that completely. But then you change it into their card. Um, I remember Joshua J doing that on one of his projects, and I really like that. Um, I used to do that. I used to do that, and I haven't done that in a while. That's something I should go back and start doing, I think. But yeah, I mean, there's so many different color changes. I suppose at the end of the day, I'm digressing here. I suppose at the end of the day, the key thing is just doing, figuring out the right color change for the right trick that you're working on. So, you know, I'm talking about how the shapeshifter is great, but it's only great if you're in a situation where the shapeshifter will work. You know, the shapeshifter might not be the best slide for that particular moment in time. It might be that you want to change the card here, in which case maybe a, a paintbrush change might be the best type of option. You kind of pick the best color change for the trick you're doing at that particular time, I think is the, uh, is the best way to say that. But let me know. Let me know in the comments down below, what's your favorite color change? I, I love color changes. Uh, I was working out the other day. I know probably about 50 of them. Uh, and I only use probably 10 or 15 ever, but I've got all these other color changes that I learned just for the sake of it, because I love learning color changes. So let me know what your favorite color changes. Okay, so the next question is from Chris James Magic, and Chris James Magic says, with the new key master, can we make them out of our house keys like you do? Yes, you can. That is how I originally wanted key master, and that's when the original key master came out. That's what it was. And then, uh, as I say, I had nothing to do with Keymaster Chrome, but they changed it in Keymaster Chrome. But then, you know, I, I, I had nothing to do with that. But that was so far away of my original vision for Keymaster. My original vision for Keymaster was you supplied with key blanks because then you can cut it to the shape of your house key and you've always got the gimmick on you because if you're going to unlock your house key, a house at some point, you're going to need your key. So you're always going to have the gimmicks on you to be able to do that routine. And that's why... I, uh, I I had it as a key blank, and, and one thing I've been very clear about with Penguin is when we re-release this, uh, as well as all the new routines and the new gimmicks, they have to be blanks. They have to be blanks. So, yeah, they are going to be blanks, which is great because a lot of people, they prefer using the blanks, whilst other people like having them cut, and you can go either way with it. But if they're cut, you don't really have the option. Okay, so the next question is from David M. Hey, David, I hope you're well. Uh, you've touched on this in the past, but how do you keep track of all your magic items and effects? I just moved last month from a house to a three-bedroom condo, and aside from moving the furniture, 90% of my personal items I had to move was magic stuff. My magic items, hundreds of decks of cards, magic effects I've bought, ending up taking over 20 boxes to fill. Wow. Lately, I spend hours at night trying to find one particular item, and it can be so frustrating. How do you organize all your magic items? Well, I'm lucky in that I've got an office. I mean, I'm here in an office with like seven or eight rooms and a huge, massive warehouse. Um, and, and at home, I've got a big home office as well with lots of different sections and so on and so forth. So I've got a lot of space. And realistically, the more magic you have, the more space you're going to need. There's no two ways about it. Um, in an ideal world, you would have a room dedicated to magic and you'd have loads of kind of drawers, uh, almost like the sort of thing that you'd see in a Lego shop. It's like, okay, these are the heads, these are the middles, these are the, all of these different things. And you can have different things in each one. So these are my gaff decks. Uh, these are my regular decks. These are my uh, gaffed coins. These are my packet tricks. And you just have everything catalogued. 
um, and, and label. That's probably the best way to do it. So it's almost like a bat cave. So when you go into a gig, you kind of go in there and you go, right, okay, I'm going to take a packet trip. Which one am I going to take? I'm going to take that one right there. I'm going to take a coin. Right, I'm going to take that purse because that's got that coin set in. I'm going to take this gimmick deck of cards. I'm going to take this regular deck of cards. And you kind of have it set up almost like the bat cave. And you can just go in and pick the stuff you need for that particular gig and then put it back where it's meant to be. That's ultimately the best way to do it, but it would require a lot of space. But if you've got a lot of stuff, the only option is you keep it in boxes, you keep it disorganized, or you find the space in order to make sure that it's all catalogued. Catalog um, and I try to be as organized as I can. It doesn't always work because I am quite disorganized, but I have become more organized over the years. And so I know where most of my stuff is. Okay, so another question from David M. Uh, your coin sleight of hand makes it look like real magic. Thank you very much. So I decided as a hobbyist who has focused 99% of my time on card slides these past 16 months after your interview with Eric Jones where he said every magician should start with coins. That made sense to me. I've learned a few false transfers over the past month and I also own Greg Wilson's split focus imagination coins and a few half dollar gravity flippers. What's the best way for me to really get to the next level with coins as it fascinates me how you make a coin disappear? Realistically, dude, it's just practice. Uh, that's all it is. It is just practice. Uh, you just what you want to make. The, the, I haven't got a coin on me. I don't think I have. I've a, a, you want to you want to learn as many techniques as you possibly can. That's the key thing here. You want to learn as many techniques as you possibly can. And you just want to make it look flawless. Every single time, you just want to look flawless. Because different slights will work in different situations. You know, for example, something like a full, uh, just a finger palm false transfer is a great way to actually vanish a coin if you're completely surrounded. But, you know, something like Ben, uh, ben Williams' version of the JW grip, I mean, that's a great one to use, but it becomes a little bit more angly, if that makes sense. Um, you know, retention passes are great, but you, need, you do need to have a lot of practice to make that retention pass look good. The key thing is practice. Don't worry about too many gimmicks. It's nice to have gimmicks. Don't get me wrong. Everybody loves gimmicks and they do make things easier. And I'm all for gimmicks. You guys know that. I Flippers, shells, split coins, whatever it is. I love gimmicks. I, I owe it to my audience to do the best possible trick I can do. And if that means that I'm going to use a gaff, then so be it. I've got no problem with that. But having said that... Um, you do want to have a good basis of sleight of hand and uh, pick the moves that feel natural to you. So, for example, you see a lot of people doing that trick where they go, doing that move where they go from heel clip and they kind of touch their hand or they, they, they kind of do this sort of thing and they grab it with their... I'm just not very good at that. I never have been. I can't make it look natural. While something like the Vernon Steel is something that I, uh, I feel really natural doing. The Vernon Steel and the Vernon Load. I also uh, like this sort of thing where you point to your arm and it disappears. So there's lots of different ways of accomplishing the same thing. And I think the best thing to do is to look for the one that feels the most natural in your hands. And without this turning into a big sales pitch, on Netrix, there is a huge slight section on tons of slights with coins and a, a kind of a breakdown of when they're useful and when they're not useful. So if it's something you want to get more into, um, then joining Netrix would probably be a good thing to do because it's going to give you access to a lot of stuff immediately that might help you. Okay, so the next question is from Jack Life, and Jack says, Hey, Craig, are we ever going to see the boss, Mrs. Sarah Petta? Yes, she is the boss, and no, you're not. Uh, you'll hear her being very sarcastic behind the camera because she is very sarcastic, uh, but you'll never see her in front of the camera. She's not a person that uh, likes being on camera. She's not a performer. Um, she never has been. She never will be. She doesn't like to be centre of attention, and she definitely doesn't like to be on camera. So you'll probably hear her being sarcastic behind the scenes. Not today, because I'm in the room on my own filming this today. But um, you're never going to see her in front of the camera, uh, ever, really. It's just, it's just something that she doesn't, she feels really uncomfortable doing. So unfortunately, the only person who's seeing Sarah is me. So there you go. Okay, so the next question is from Jay Michael, and Jay says, great video as usual. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, can you tell us about some of your more memorable gigs? Some of the crazy, funny stuff that's happened throughout your performing career. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, there's tons of them. There's absolutely tons of them. I've got millions of stories that I could tell, and every magician has. Every magician has a funny story that they can tell, a funny performing story. Um... 
Yeah, and there's so many of them, really, aren't there, when you think about it. Uh, I, 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 at some point, I'll drip some of these out over various different videos over the time. But uh, I think I might have told this on a 5x5 before. I'm not too sure. But one of the worst things that ever happened to me was um, when I went to perform at a comedy club. Now, to give this a frame of reference, I was working with Russell Leeds at the time. And... Um, we dreamed about being stage performers, but we've never performed on stage before. And uh, we had a phone call from a comedy club in Warrington asking us if we would headline their comedy club, both the first and the half, uh, first half and the second half. And I said, yes, we would immediately. Um, and it was in a week's time. And, and the problem was both myself and Russell were not funny and nor did we have any performing ability on stage. Uh, and I really should have said no, because going straight into a comedy club when you're completely unprepared is a recipe for disaster. And it was a recipe for disaster, to be perfectly honest, because we got there and we hadn't really prepped anything. We'd come up with a couple of different routines, but we hadn't really prepped anything. And then um, we were we were there. And, and the problem was we were watching the other acts because we were supposed to headline the first half and the second half. And we were watching the other acts in the first half. And man, they were hilarious. They were really good. And we were just like, oh, my God, we're going to. We look at, we're going to die because they're hilarious and we're not. And, um, and, and it came for us to go on stage and um, it, it was dreadful. It was dreadful. And the big trick that we'd thought of doing for the end of the first half was uh, this lottery prediction. Because it was around about the time that Darren had predicted the lottery or maybe a bit before. I can't remember. And uh, we had this idea of predicting the lottery and how I'd actually come up with the method was I had a, a Fabrice clipboard. So you write on this thing and there's a little monitor backstage that tells you what they're writing. And I had Russell backstage with a flat change bag and these little mini balls with numbers on them, almost like a bingo thing uh, from one to 49. And the idea is I would get somebody to write down six numbers on a piece of paper. He would see backstage the six numbers come up and he would take those balls, put them in one side of the change bag and dump the others into the other side of the change bag. Um, that was the idea. So I was on stage and I said, Russ, go and get the balls for me. And he said, yeah, OK, I'm going. And uh, I got this guy to write six numbers down and I made a big deal of not looking and I was like, right, rip it off, fold it in half, fold it in half, fold it in half again. And then I turned around and I was like, uh, right, Russ, have you got the balls? And I didn't hear him. There was no answer. And I was like, Russ, have you got the balls? And all I heard was, no. I'm like, why haven't you got them? He's like, I can't find them. Imagine this is going on on stage in front of a real audience, right? It's like uh, uh, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And I look into the wings and he's there doing this. Which ultimately meant that it hasn't worked. I have no idea what numbers the person's thinking of. And I, no experience on stage before. I was like, I know I'm going to have to kill time, but what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And a million thoughts are racing through my head. And I remember saying, um, do you think you can find them? And Russ was like, no. I was like, are they in the car? I don't think so. I was like, oh my God. And so I thought, well, the only way that I can possibly get out of this is by asking this guy to write the numbers down again and hoping it works. So I took his piece of paper off him. And as I took it off him, I said, now, you can't see through this, can you? And I flicked it open with one hand. I was like, oh, oh, I've seen the numbers now. You're going to have to write them down again, which was so cringy. And, and there was booing. Like, it was terrible. So... Um, I gave him the pad again. I was like, write the numbers down again. I'm really sorry. Write six different numbers. And I knew it'd work because I heard a little yes from the wings, which suggested to me that uh, it came on the mic over the audience, which suggested to me that it worked. So um, Russ came out with this flat change bag. And, um, you know, I was like, right, OK, nobody could know the numbers. I got somebody else up to pull the numbers out and they matched and it was terrible. Uh, and what was even worse is the guy had got bored and wrote one, two, three, four, five, six. So it was so anticlimactic. It was ridiculous. And we knew we'd died on our ass. The audience obviously knew we'd died on our ass. And the organiser who had, remember, booked us to do the finale of the first half and the finale of the second half, he came up to us and he said, uh, oh, you know, you were going to do the finale of the second half. We think it might be best if you just do the first five minutes. Uh, and we'll put a different act on at the end of the second half. And we were like, all right, I know what that means. Um, and 
you know, they, uh, they were supposed to be filming everything and giving us loads of content. Uh, and they, they didn't film anything. And I was like, oh, didn't you film? He's like, no, we've run out of tape. It, there were digital cameras. Like, it was just, we we just, we were an embarrassment. And uh, we were stuck there. So at the end of our five minutes, we were there, sitting there in full view, just off to one side, having a drink, drowning our sorrows. And um, the finale of the act, I'll never forget the guy's name. His name was DJ K Weezy. And his gimmick was that he would take things from the audience and rap about them. And I had to sit there with Russell for 20 minutes listening to DJ K Weezy rap about how shit we were. Honestly, I've never wanted the ground to open up and swallow me whole more in my life. And it was a terrible, terrible, terrible experience. And it was years before I went back on stage again. Um, so, yeah, there you go. That's I'll, I'll, I'll do more stories down the line. They take a, t a while to tell. But that is probably the worst I've ever died in any gig ever before, since. It was just horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Okay, so the next question is from David Julian, and David says, when's your next Alakazam release? Well, if you're watching this on Sunday, I'm filming this on uh, Wednesday, but if you're watching this on Sunday, you will know that my latest Alakazam trick has just come out. I did a live launch for it on Thursday, which is tomorrow. No, it's today. It's tonight. Christ, it's tonight. I'm doing a live launch tonight, which would have been a few days ago for you. My God, it's tonight. Uh, it's called Playlist uh, by Alakazam, and you can go and get it directly from Alakazam now. It'll be it'll be available to buy, and it's part of their Wallet series, and it's all based on song download cards. And I'll, uh, I, I, it's I, you've probably seen these before, but I travel around the whole of the UK, and I stop at a lot of service stations, and service stations even to this day they have these little cards that you can pick up especially in places like Starbucks and Costa and you can get it and you can scan and you can download a track um it's movie download cards and it's like hey you bought a coffee have a free download track on us and um even if you haven't seen these before it's a great hook because it's such a plausible thing because it is a real thing so these song download cards are included in playlist and the whole idea is that you keep them in the wallet and it's, it's a 15-minute act that you can have in your wallet and you can do either as one 15-minute act or you can break it down into smaller subsections. And it's, um, yeah, it's just really fun. It's a really cool routine to do. There's some mentalism stuff. There's the best wild card ever that you learn as part of this project as well. There's a whole bunch of different stuff that you can do with this. Um, so, yeah, it's called, um, it's called Playlist. And it's available now from Alakazam. I'm sure they'll have a trailer and everything up. Uh, but if you've got any particular questions on it, I'll probably put it on a review show at some point, uh, get Ryland to perform it. But if you've got any questions about it, please let me know. But it's, yeah, it's really super fun. It's, it's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great product and it's something I'm really proud of. And it's another one of their wallet series. So if you're looking for something that's part of your everyday carry, this is a great thing to go for. And the final question today is by Lucas Z. And Lucas says, um, Hi, Craig. I've been a big fan of your reviews. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Question from me. I recently dropped my shell. Do you have any advice on how you can fix it? Thanks. The way uh, I imagine if it's dropped, it's kind of dinged so that when you put the coin in there, it's going to get stuck in there. It's hard to get out. The way I've always dealt with that is to get a pocket square, to get a nice thick pocket square, men's pocket handkerchief. And wrap the coin up in it once so you put or twice depending but you put the uh you put the, the the handkerchief and it can't be one of those magician silks it needs to be thicker than that you put that over the coin and then you put the shell over that and push down hard and what that will do is that extra fabric inside the shell will push the shell out if you leave it overnight and then just pull the, the handkerchief out, that will pop the shell out, and you should find that you shouldn't have a problem then. That's, it depends on how big the ding is, but if it's only a small ding, and it's, it's, it's now getting stuck in there a little bit, that typically is what you need to do to sort it out. There is one other question here today, and that's from Mick, and he says, Hi Craig, got Norfolk wallet, really struggling to master the single-handed palm. Any hints or tips for this? I've done a lot of searching on YouTube, but it only really covers the two-handed version. Thank you. Um, so the one-handed palm is... Uh, there we go. 
So a one-handed palm is when you have a deck of cards and you just literally palm the card and it goes directly into your hand. It's very, very useful because normally with a two-handed palm, you know, your hands are coming together in order to do that palming action. Whilst with a one-handed palm, um, it's great because you can hold it, you can have the card controlled to the top, for example, and you can say, hold your hand out for me. Brilliant. Can you take those cards? And, and, and the palm takes place as you're gesturing with this hand, and then you can come back and give them the deck. So there's extra misdirection when it comes to stealing that card off the top of the deck. So your question is, how do you do that? Because, and, and you can see that like with practice, you can do it every single time, absolutely not a problem. And with practice, you can even make it look quite good as a color change. You know, we talked about color changes earlier, but for example, I can show an ace of spades and shake it and turn it into a jack and then have it change back into an ace. Um, so the, the problem that a lot of people have, first of all, the grip on the deck is very important. You want to have it so that the thumb is down here at the bottom left, the fingers are along the front. It's the pinky finger that's doing the majority of the work. The little finger is going to be pushing right here on the upper right corner, assuming you're right-handed. Now, the mistake that a lot of people make, and I'm going to try and do it accidentally on purpose, is they push down and the card swings out like that. OK, so they push down and the card swings out. Now, that happens a lot of the time when you're pushing too far down. So if I push down here, what will happen is that will go up there like that. You want to push right on the extreme edge of the card. So you're going to pull right on the extreme edge of the card and that takes it straight into that palm position. Right. That's the first thing. There you go. The second thing is you don't want to have, be too far over to the left hand side of the deck. You want to make sure that you kind of over the top like that so that when you palm it away, it goes straight into the palm. Um, make sure that the thumb, I, I find it easier if the thumb's extended down below a little bit because that just makes it a little bit easier for me. Um, but the, 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 the pinky finger is doing 90% of the work here. So 90% of the work is being done by the, uh, by the little finger, by the pinky finger. That's what's doing the majority of the work, as you can see. That's what's... Uh, doing the majority of the work the, and, and realistically outside of that it's just practice you're going to get really frustrated with it because when you start doing it it's going to go out there like that and you're going to get really frustrated and you're going to think this is never going to work it's one of those things that's very very knacky but once you've got it you just have it and then you'll be able to do it every single time and it is absolutely the best palm to do if you're palming one card because like i say you can do it under that misdirection and they just don't see the palming action at all and you can do it like throwing cards you can do a, a, the palm as you throw the cards down on the table um or however you want to or as you bring your hands up here like this or whatever you want to do but as i say it even works as a color change so you can do a double lift and show the uh show the card and shake it and it changes and, and then have it change back. So yeah, uh, just practice it. Just practice over and over again. And you'll find that just when you get to the point where you want to throw the deck against the wall and you're going to give up completely, that's pretty much when, you, when you're going to get it. Okay. And when you get it, you'll get it every single time. But remember, it's that pinky finger that does the majority of the work the rest of the cards are just keeping the rest of the fingers and the thumb are just keeping the cards completely squared and it's that little finger that's pushing that card into into place into the hand okay boom like that okay so uh yeah that's the that's that's the big tips that i can give you on the one-handed palm hopefully that's going to help you so there you go, guys. That is another Q&A in the bag. Thank you very much for joining me here on a Sunday afternoon. I hope you have an amazing day, and I hope you enjoyed the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much for checking out Magic TV. I really appreciate it. If you haven't already done so, please go to www.magictv.org, put your email address in. We'll let you know when Netflix goes live. Also, if you want to see more videos like this, you know what you've got to do. Just like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below. I'm going to be back again tomorrow at, uh, I'm going to be back again. Well, I'm actually going to be back today. So I'm going to have a shorts at two. At six o'clock, I'm going to have a live. At nine o'clock, I've got a review show special with the one and only Christian Grace. This is going to be absolutely amazing. So look out for that. That's tonight at uh, six, nine o'clock. And then tomorrow, I'm going to be here at six. Six o'clock with Magic Live, two o'clock with the shorts, and at nine o'clock with a five by five. So there's a lot going on here on Magic TV. I'll see you again soon. Thanks very much for watching. My name's Craig from Magic TV. Mm -hmm.